Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you might happen to be. Uh, I'm Doff McElhenney. I am an interventional pediatric and adult, adult congenital cardiologist at Stanford. And I have the pleasure of talking to you today about a breakthrough transcatheter pulmonary valve treatment option for both adults and children with congenital heart disease, the Harmony valve. Uh, if you have questions during the presentation, hopefully we'll have time to address those at the end. So please enter those into the chat and hopefully we'll be able to get to them. I am a proctor and consultant for Medtronic in the way of disclosures. And in today's presentation, we're going to be talking about the Harmony valve. Um, we will go over the technology, look at the patient population, talk about the procedure, both planning and implant, present the clinical data that are available and um, go from there. The Harmony valve is um, a transcatheter pulmonary valve that was just approved um, with an PMA approval by the FDA. And I was an investigator in the investigational trials and have been working um, with the transcatheter pulmonary valve um, program um, programs in this congenital space for, for um, since the very beginning. The first uh, device that was approved in this country started trials in 2007, and I've been a part of that. I, so I've seen this device very closely. There's very limited clinical data at this point because it was just approved, but we will give you everything we've got. And um, if we can't um, cover it in the presentation, we will address the questions that you might have. So the Harmony valve is a porcine pericardial tissue valve that is designed for transcatheter implant. The valve itself is laser cut. It's mounted on a self-expanding nitinol frame. And that frame is um, covered internally with a polyester fabric. Um, this is an integrated device. So it's a single device for uh, pulmonary valve implantation. And the, the structure of it is characterized by individual um, rows of nitinol wire that um, are then sewn together. So there's six rows in each of these devices that are sewn together. So they're articulated at these sutures. Um, and it's designed to conform to the native right ventricular outflow tract anatomy. At present, there are two devices uh, designed to fit a wide range of patient anatomies. These two devices listed here are the Harmony TPV-22 and the Harmony TPV-25. They differ both in length, um, diameter, and in valve size. So as the name suggests, the TPV-22 has a 22 millimeter valve, the TPV-25 has a 25 millimeter valve, and then the inflow and outflow portions of the device um, are substantially wider to um, conform to the highly variable right ventricular outflow tract anatomy. The Harmony valve is delivered with a dedicated delivery system that is useful for both sizes. Um, there's a loading funnel system that collapses the valve, so it doesn't require a cold uh, ice water bath to collapse the nitinol. And then there's an ergonomic handle design that facilitates um, predictable deployment of this single device in the intended position. The tip of the delivery sheath is radio pig to help with positioning. And the mechanism of release of the valve is this um, helical um, screw-like coil that attaches to loops on the most proximal row of the device. The Harmony valve, it's indicated for the treatment of both pediatric and adult patients, there's no defined age range, who have pulmonary regurgitation that is clinically significant. So it says severe here, but that's determined by echocardiography or by MRI, a regurgitant fraction that's greater than or equal to 30% uh, in patients with a native or surgically repaired right ventricular outflow tract who are clinically indicated for surgical pulmonary valve replacement. Uh, contraindications are very few, just active endocarditis or infection or a known nitinol intolerance. Why Harmony valve? Now, the need is really based on the fact that there was no prior transcatheter valve device that was appropriate for the treatment of uh, congenital heart disease patients with a native or surgically repa uh, repaired right ventricular outflow tract, which is typically quite large and in pulmonary regurgitation. So that's the need that led to the development of this unique device. 
just a little bit about the history, depending on your familiarity, you may not um, sort of think about this population much. And these slides refer specifically to Tetralogy of Fallot, but even though that's the most common patient population in who we anticipate using this valve, it's not the only one. And what these two, um, this figure and this table basically tell you is that pulmonary regurgitation after repair of Tetralogy of Fallot has a detrimental cascade that lead, first large uh, pulmonary regurgitation leads to right ventricular volume overload and dilation, which can have an impact on the function of the ventricle, on arrhythmias, um, and is associated with a higher risk of um, functional impairment, ventricular tachycardia, or death. Um, and all of the details here are not necessarily important, but the, the point is to say that pulmonary regurgitation after tetralogy repair or after treatment of valvar pulmonary stenosis or other conditions has um, a series of uh, detrimental effects that can lead to uh, adverse outcomes in this patient population. There's a lot of debate within the congenital heart world about the appropriate indications for the timing of pulmonary valve replacement in patients with tetralogy. And just to be clear, most of these indications were developed when we were looking at surgical pulmonary valve replacement as the only option. Um, but basically the criteria um, include some measure of volume. And in this particular table, if the right ventricular end diastolic Systolic volume index is greater than 160 milliliters per meter squared. Other recommendations list this at 150, some list it higher, some list it lower, um, and some list other ways of measuring volume. But if there's a dilated right ventricle, if there is a decreased function um, of the left ventricle or the right ventricle um, or other factors, then there's an indication aside from symptoms for pulmonary valve replacement. In a patient with regurgitation and symptoms, that alone is sufficient indication to uh, implant a pulmonary valve. There are not specific indications for transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement, but they should be at least this low of a threshold and potentially lower. The benefits of pulmonary valve implantation are relatively straightforward. It decreases or eliminates regurgitation. It increases the effective right ventricle stroke volume, reduces right ventricular diastolic and systolic volumes. Um, it increases LV volume, improves right ventricular systolic function, symptoms, functional status, quality of life, and exercise cardiopulmonary function. So pl placement of a pulmonary valve when there's severe pulmonary regurgitation is clinically beneficial. The challenge in coming up with a transcatheter device that can treat pulmonary regurgitation in this population is that there's an incredibly wide variety of um, right ventricular outflow tract anatomies after repair of tetralogy of Fallot. And this is just an example from a pace paper where the authors characterized this variety. And you can just see that it's, it's quite staggering. Every single one of these patients is different. They fit these into certain patterns, but the fact is that the specific features, even within the patterns are quite different. So that's an incredible engineering challenge to come up with a device or a small number of devices that fit across this wide range of anatomies that have a similar physiologic or pathophysiologic impairment, namely the pulmonary regurgitation and right ventricular dilation. So um, as you may or may not be aware, um, approximately 1% of patients um, are born with congenital heart disease and about one fifth of those involve some abnormality of the right ventricular outflow tract. And these patients are generally repaired early in life but they're not truly repaired in the sense that they're often left with sequelae. And most of these patients with some abnormality of the right ventricular outflow tract are going to get a type of repair that will leave them with pulmonary regurgitation in a right ventricular outflow tract that is large, abnormal, um, and complicated. It's this subset of patients with congenital heart disease primarily who the Harmony valve is specifically designed to meet. So who develops severe pulmonary regurgitation? Uh, the most common um, group of patients are those with repaired, usually surgically repaired congenital heart disease, most commonly tetralogy of Fallot, but also valvar pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary atresia with an intact ventricular septum, double outlet right ventricle, and occasionally some other conditions. Also patients with valvar pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary atresia who underwent 
a balloon procedure, a balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty or pulmonary valvotomy early in life, they can develop severe pulmonary regurgitation and be appropriate candidates for this device. And occasionally there are other patients who haven't had either any of these um, interventions, whether they have pulmonary hypertension or congenital PR, or occasionally consequences of some other non-congenital cardiac or thoracic surgery. So if you're not taking care of congenital patients all the time, how do you figure out whether patients might be a potential candidates? Well, history is one sort of relatively straightforward way to do that. If it's a patient who's got a history of tetralogy of Fallot or valvar pulmonary stenosis or pulmonary atresia, chances are pretty good that they either have either had a pulmonary valve replacement or will need one at some point. So I would consider that a very strong red flag that they may be a potential candidate for this therapy. Um, on physical exam, Look, pulmonary regurgitation has characteristic findings, as, do, um, as does right ventricular um, enlargement. So any physical exam finding that is suggestive of pulmonary regurgitation, tricuspid regurgitation, a large right ventricle, or um, you know, anything related to right heart dysfunction, particularly in the context of a history of congenital heart disease, should be a, a, a sign that this may be a patient who you should think about whether a pulmonary valve replacement um, is indicated. Imaging echocardiography, if the right ventricle is large, that's an important first step. It can be difficult to image the right ventricular outflow tract, particularly if the right ventricle is large. Um, so that may not always be easy to, 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 to detect with color or with um, spectral Doppler, but certainly that is um, a pretty clear indication when you can see the output tract. Often pulmonary regurgitation is accompanied by some degree of tricuspid regurgitation. So that may be an additional indicator. Um, the most um, favored imaging modalities for looking at the right ventricle, looking at pulmonary regurgitation in general are MRI and CT. Um, if you're doing an MRI, when they measure RV volumes, if the RV volume index is larger than 130, 140, 150, or if the volume ratio of the right ventricle to the left ventricle is two or more, those are both signs of significant right ventricular enlargement. In some patients, if you index the volume, you still may get 110 or 120, but if the left ventricle is indexed at 55 or 60, it still may be, or the right ventricle still may be twice as large as the LV or more. So look at both of those factors when you're thinking about whether there's um, significant right ventricular dilation. And then we also measure the pulmonary regurgitant volume or fraction. And as I said earlier, 30% is usually the threshold that we look at for this condition um, and treating it um, with a valve. But if there is lesser pulmonary regurgitation, but symptoms or an inordinate degree of dilation, that would also be uh, potentially uh, treatable. The current standard of care for pulmonary regurgitation has been surgical repair or more commonly replacement of the pulmonary valve with some form of bioprosthetic valve or conduit. Um, the goals of the Harmony transcatheter pulmonary valve um, are to allow one for significantly less invasiveness of a valve replacement procedure. This is a transcatheter procedure, um, not an open heart procedure, and potentially to allow earlier intervention to allow um, uh, prevention of some of the development of right ventricular dilation and dysfunction that occurs in this patient population um, without the concomitant risk of surgery. And ultimately to provide more options and um, potentially sort of a closer therapeutic um, alignment over the course of a patient's lifetime. I'd like to go through the procedure a little bit here. I don't wanna to get too much into the weeds, but I just wanted to sort of talk about how we think about identifying candidates. Um, because the RVOT anatomy is so complex, um, it's hard to detail exactly what measurements to look at. The right ventricular outflow tract is often asymmetric. But what I would say is if there's any, if you've got this, this clinical um, scenario and any measurement in the main pulmonary artery from the valve on up to the bifurcation is less than 38 millimeters, this patient may be a candidate for a Harmony valve. So in that case, just refer the patient or connect with a Harmony uh, implanting cardiologist. If you don't know who that is, you can go to the Medtronic website and determine that or go to the ACHA website and identify the adult congenital heart program in your area. Once we've identified potential candidates by, based on either ECHO or MRI, um, which are the more common imaging modalities, we perform a specific CT protocol 
to um, perform a dedicated Harmony patient screening process that we use to determine anatomic fit. Um, this has um, been, been an excellent approach to doing this. It's a retrospectively gated CT scan in which we look at isolated end diastolic and end systolic cardiac phases, uh, make extensive measurements throughout the outflow tract, which I'll show you here in a moment, and then determine whether the, um, there's appropriate oversizing, appropriate length, and appropriate fit. This is an example of some of the images that we have from a screening report. So these are obviously CT images here and 3D reconstructions, but this is what we call the perimeter plot, which is a plot of um, perimeter di derived di diameters that are fit into an algorithm for sizing the device. And this allows us to say, yes, this patient is a candidate anatomically or as in the case of this one, or no, they are not. And the green here, as uh, you would imagine, signals yes, but they need to have appropriate oversizing of the device at both the inflow ends and the outflow ends. The report is more extensive than this, but this is just a good example of what we're working with and some of the images and how we um, make these determinations um, and the service kind of that is provided from this report to the implanter. Here's just a quick animation schematic of how deployment of this system works. It's a percutaneous system. It's usually deployed from a femoral venous approach. As you can see, this uh, dedicated delivery system is being advanced over a guide wire that's located in this case in the left pulmonary artery. Once it's to its intended location, the tip is advanced, pulled back to where the deployment should begin, and the covering sheath is retracted, allowing expansion of the self-expanding device which then opposes itself against the walls of the main pulmonary artery, and then back across the right ventricular outflow tract. The device is then released by unscrewing. The delivery system is retracted back into the right atrium and down into the IVC. Then the tip is withdrawn um, and the wire is then withdrawn after confirming position and confirming function of the device. So this is just a quick example of a patient after performing a hemodynamic right heart catheterization. We take biplane angiographic views of the right ventricular outflow tract in a projections that were recommended on the screening report. And you can see there's severe pulmonary regurgitation here. We advance the delivery system and begin to open the device. And you can see this is a partially open device. While we're doing this, we take sighting angiograms to confirm appropriate location, fully uncover the device as you can see here. And then after it's released, you've got a device that looks exactly as it should. It's opened up both proximally distally and angiography in the pulmonary artery afterwards shows that you've got a well-functioning pulmonary valve with no leakage follow up angiography in the right ventricular outflow tract confirms that the valve opens nicely. There's no leakage around the device on the inflow. Um, and there you have it. This is um, a relatively straightforward procedure. And now you've got a functioning pulmonary valve um, with a percutaneous procedure that um, went very smoothly. We'll often use ice afterwards, but this just shows you what the pulmonary valve looks like in situ with intracardiac echocardiography. Leaflets move nicely. Um, there's no obstruction or regurgitation. And there you have it. So the clinical data on this device is based on, at this point, there was an early feasibility trial, um, which used only the TPV22 device. And then there was a pivotal trial, an ID trial, in which we implanted both TPV25 and 22 devices. And then a continued access study, which um, allowed us to continue implanting the device after the uh, um, initial study data were submitted to the FDA. Um, we followed pretty much all of these patients for a month um, and about half at the point in time these data were locked for six months to a year. And as you can see here at six months in a year, um, there's really almost very little pulmonary regurgitation or paravalvular leak at all. Um, there's no significant obstruction and none of these patients have undergone um, reoperation. Um, no endocarditis, no major stent fractures, no thrombosis, no death, no procedural adverse events of any of those kinds either. Um, 
There was one valve and valve procedure that was performed acutely because of um, inappropriate uh, device sizing at the time. And a small number of patients had stable, short-lived um, and self-limited um, PVCs or ventricular tachycardia related to the device touching the right ventricular outflow tract, but none of those persisted. So in conclusion, this is um, the Harmony valve. It's the first FDA approved transcatheter pulmonary valve for native um, or surgically repaired right ventricular outflow tract dysfunction. It's a breakthrough technology that is addressing a really common and important unmet need in congenital heart patients, many of whom are adults, but not all. We implant this both in children and ad in adults. Um, and we're seeing that it's also allowing us to meet um, the need for treatment in patients who are not great surgical candidates um, for any of a variety of reasons. So I think we're only gonna continue to understand um, how um, this new device, this new breakthrough technology allows us to modify what we're able to offer to this population. Um, clinical data su so far support safety and uh, effectiveness of the procedure um, and both the initial clinical trial, the continued access study, and then the post-approval study, which will be starting soon, are pro prospective studies that will be following patients for 10 years. So we should have excellent data. It's gonna take time, but we'll have excellent data. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the Harmony valve, you can scan the QR code there, which will take you to the Harmony page on the Medtronic website. Um, if you are not in the congenital field yourself, if you follow patients with pulmonary regurgitation, or with repaired tetralogy of flow, and you're not sure whether a Harmony valve is indicated or feasible, please just reach out, contact an implanting cardiologist. They will be listed on the um, Harmony valve website, Medtronic, and this QR code can get there. Or if that doesn't sort of address your area, reach out to your regional adult congenital heart disease center. Um, the Adult Congenital Heart Association website provides a, a listing of centers. Obviously, there's other ways to figure that out as well. Um, now, again, this is not only for adults. It's not only for adults with congenital heart disease, but many patients will have adult congenital heart disease. And it may be one of the places, particularly if your primary practice is adult cardiology, um, where you're going to find the most um, assistance with uh, getting the appropriate evaluation and hopefully therapy for, um, for your patients with pulmonary regurgitation. Well, thank you very much. I would be happy to take questions if you have any. And um, otherwise, good luck. And um, please reach out um, if there is, is any interest or questions on down the line.